Hello, everyone. Welcome to our second iteration of our history series with Julia Sisek. Uh, we're super excited to get started today. Thank you, everyone who's joining us. And thank you also, everyone who's been engaging on, on the chat since a couple of days ago. It was, it was really refreshing to, to land here today and see all your messages. So, um, hi, I'm Kabachia and I'll be your host for tonight. I'm just here to do some housekeeping stuff and introduce Julia in a little bit. Um, but before we officially begin, we always like to take a moment to respectfully acknowledge the indigenous peoples who have stewarded the land we are on for time immemorial. So I want to acknowledge the peoples of Joshua Tree National Park, who are the Kawiya, Serrano, Chemewevi, and Mojave tribes. And I also want to acknowledge the peoples of Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is a place where I'm tuning in from today, the Jicarilla Apache and the Pueblo peoples. And Julia, I passed it on to you. Yeah, and I am tuning in today from uh, what is now known as Berkeley, California, which is Chuchenyo Ohlone land. Thank you for that. And once again, this event is possible thanks to the support from the Desert Institute, which is the educational branch of the Joshua Tree National Park Association that's dedicated to bringing all sorts of cultural, artistic, and scientific programs to normally the field within Joshua Tree National Park and neighboring lands, but now also virtual through Desert Live. So thanks so much for the Desert Institute and thank you for all of you who've been able to donate so that we can continue with our virtual programming and reach more, more community beyond just the ones that are close to the desert. Um, I wanna take a moment to introduce Julia Sizek. She's a PhD candidate in anthropology at the University of California, Berkeley. Her research concerns contemporary land use and conflicts over land management in the Eastern Mojave Desert in Southern California. As part of her research, Julia has worked with a number of local desert organizations, including the Native American Land Conservancy, the Coachella Valley History Museum, Mojave Desert Land Trust, and 20, 29 Palms Historical Society. And today, she is here to grace us with the history of the jackrabbit homesteads in the Mojave. And we're excited to learn something about that. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. I'll pass it on to you. Yeah. So um, if you all have questions during the talk, just go ahead and put them in the chat and then we'll have a Q&A at the very end. So um, I'm totally willing and happy to talk about your questions. I probably if you have questions about an individual small tract, I probably don't have an answer for you. So I apologize for that. Um, but I can answer a lot of general questions about the Small Tract Act and its effects. Uh, throughout the Mojave Desert. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you all so that you can see uh, something prettier than my face, which is my beautiful pictures that I've found for you from the archives. Um, and so I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, so anyone who has driven through Wonder Valley has seen what the geographer Alex Clark called in 1971 the Minimum Small Tract Act Cabin, a 12 by 16 foot building footprint that barely met the minimum requirements of the Small Tract Act at the time when it was permitted and built under the then very lax rules of San Bernardino County. Today, these cabins are, for lack of a better term, ruin porn, combining the affective poles of, a yes of yesteryear and today's love of tiny homes with the dilapidation of pastel colors, clean lines, and hantavirus. But today, I'm not here to tell you about the people who are living off the grid in these new old tiny homes or how artists are making these shacks beautiful and hip. I'm also not here to tell you about the capital R romantic past, a time when Bonanza was on TV and people tried homesteading anew in San Bernardino County. Small Tract Act builders were not actually homesteaders, but instead vacationers and weekenders who were looking for their desert getaway 
a similar class of people to the Airbnbers who come out to the California desert today. So today I'm here to tell you some historical stories about what people thought about what they called back then shacks, vacation cabins, and perhaps most erroneously jackrabbit homesteads, the last of which was a valiant stretch on the part of real estate marketers. So this is a story about the manufacturing of a California desert dream that was always already falling apart a little bit um, at the corners where the prefabricated house never quite stayed together. Even back then, in the 1950s, so-called jackrabbit homesteaders and their promoters were trying to use their, the law to enact their dreams about homesteading that rang equally false then as they do now. So this is a story about speculative dreams and their abandonment and the legacies that these dreams left behind. These stories that I'm going to share with you today come from the Morongo Basin Historical Society, the San Bernardino City Library, the 29 Palms Historical Society, as well as from archives at um, UCLA, the Huntington Library, uh, Cal State University, Los Angeles, and the National Archives at Riverside. So this is a story that begins with a particular kind of California dream and the hold that it had in the post-war period in the California desert. So let's just start with what, what did the Small Tract Act, a land disposal act that passed through Congress in 1938, do to the public lands of the California desert? What were the kinds of California dreams that refracted through this land disposal act and what did those dreams become? All right, so part one, California dreaming. Before World War II, the California desert was a pretty sleepy place. Los Angeles was hardly a metropolitan city that required escaping, and most Euro-American settlers who went to the desert specifically went for its health benefits. Um, desert visitors might go to the Agua Caliente Cahuilla Reservation in the low desert where enterprising tribal members would charge a small fee to allow them into the healing waters in an area today known as Palm Springs. In the same era, visitors to the California high desert might be seeking the same respite, looking for what late 19th century conservationists had called breathing space. While environmentalists had called this breathing space as an idealized space away from the ills and ailments of modern cities, for many desert health seekers, this was a literal breathing space. And so you can see here in this picture, um, the Desert Inn in Palm Springs, California. Um, this was a place where people would go to actually try to improve their breathing. So these are people who had tuberculosis, um, or potentially at that time, as it was known, consumption before uh, you could actually diagnose tuberculosis through x-rays. And deserts were seen as a kind of environmental cure to these sorts of ailments in the long sort of in the 60 year period between being able to diagnose lung problems without having a cure for tuberculosis, in, which didn't happen until the 1940s. And so as a result of all of these people seeking better health, there were a number of settlements that sprung up in the desert. Some of these were just sort of health resorts, places like the Desert Inn, but they were also settlements in places like the Morongo Basin. The Morongo Basin settlements were alongside settlements of homesteaders and miners in a place called Warren's Well, also known as Yucca Valley today, or 29 Palms. These settlements, of course, were already on top of native settlements like the Chemehuevi village at the Oasis of Mara and 29 Palms, land that was forcibly taken from the tribes when the railroad took every other section without actually surveying it beforehand. While conflict between white settlers and Kauia, Chemehuevi, and Serrano people sometimes flared up, the desert was not a very popular place for settlers at this time, but this was all about to change. Um, during World War II, there was a promise of a North African front, and General Patton wanted to be prepared to integrate the Army's ground and air forces in a new tactical arena. So he managed to secure the, vast, the use of vast acreage of the desert for his desert training center during 1942 through 1944. And this image is actually of a model of the, it's like a model that they made in the desert of the desert training center so that he could actually point at where they were going to do each of their exercises. During this time, tens of thousands of GIs stayed in the desert during summer and winter. 
most of these people didn't actually end up going to the North African front. The North African front was a little bit of a bust, um, but they all, but many of them did come back home. And when they came back home, they came back to a housing shortage. Um, this is a time when uh, loads of people had migrated um, to the cities to support the war effort. And then you have all these men coming back from the war, looking to start families, looking to have homes. And so you have this enormous demand for new houses. And the solution to this problem of not having enough houses, right, of course, is to build new houses and to build a new kind of house, a suburban tract home. The suburban tract home combined two, uh, three big components of sort of what was happening during this uh, post-war era. The first was these kit homes, which had already started popping up before the war. Um, you could hire, you could, you could just send in on a catalog to Sears and get your own kit home. And then it would come in, there would be all these different parts and you would assemble your home. Um, these kit homes combined with the standardization of tracks and city planning, which was sort of an emerging field in this post-World War II era. And then thirdly, you have the capital of these investors who are interested in building suburban sort of like mega, I guess, mega suburbs. Um, and so you have these planned communities with these standardized tracks, all with these kit homes, all of which look the same. And the result of all of this is what you might now know as the Los Angeles style World War II bungalows, which you can see when you drive around LA. In California, this story was particularly pronounced um, because of the growth of wartime industries, as I already mentioned, in places like the Bay Area, you have enormous growth in the Richmond shipyards, um, tons of houses. You also have the second great migration of African-Americans to urban centers in the North and the West. And so just as all of these houses were being built to try to accommodate all of these people, not only people who had come during wartime, but also people who came after the war, so were the problems of urban life accumulating. In 1948, the smog in Denora, Pennsylvania was so bad that 20 people died from the poor air quality. And smog in Los Angeles was not too far behind. Anxiety began to, began to grow as smog in the basin also accumulated. Reporters like Ed Ainsworth wrote long exposés about smog in the Los Angeles Times and other leading papers. And it was clear that Angelinos wanted an escape from the new kind of city that Los Angeles was becoming. Today, when we think about Los Angeles, we think about it as like a freeway city, a reputation that was cemented in Rainer Banham's 1971 Los Angeles, The Four Ecologies. In this architectural history of Los Angeles, Banham names Autotopia, the freeway, as the fourth ecology of the city. He writes, the freeway system in its totality is now a single comprehensible place, a coherent state of mind, a complete way of life. Another of his books, however, begins with him driving away from that same city to the California desert. He was driving, as many others were, from Los Angeles to Las Vegas when he decided to stop for a moment of quiet in the desert and became entranced by the possibility of leaving the city behind. And here's a picture of Rainer Banham on a bicycle on Bicycle Lake, how appropriate. Um, Banham, of course, he never really abandons the city. He can't leave it, but he leaves behind this book, this very silly book called Scenes in America Deserta, um, about the wonders of the desert. He was part of a broader group of people in the same era who were looking to leave American cities, the smog and their cars. Another one of these people, as many of you may know, would be Ed Abbey, right? So he famously wrote about roads being the beginning of the ends of national parks, recounting in his memoir, Desert Solitaire, about the dread that he experienced when he watched the rangers come by his trailer in arches, telling them that they were surveying for a new road. And what both of these two men index for us as historians, right, is that uh, there's a new kind of attitude to the desert. The desert is not only a place that you want to escape and leave and get through as quickly as possible, but it's also a place to visit and actually recreate in. The idea of escape from the city was very uh, appealing at this time, right? And also to escape from the city, it didn't 
people didn't really ask very much. They just wanted a weekend hideaway that could be accessed in a car. And most people were starting to acquire cars, right? There are these big symbols of middle class living. Like today, travelers could just spend three to six hours on the road. Remember, they're driving at 55 miles per hour to get to the desert. They went to go live out their post-war prosperity and the dream of investment in land for the middle class. So on to part two, which is called home sighting. Hey, Julia, I just yeah. have a quick comment. It seems yeah. like the picture is gone for some people. Can you maybe refresh your screen? As it yeah, like I, will un I will unshare. Sorry right. about that, everyone. No, no, no worries. Thank then you. We will reshare the screen and see if that works. Thank you. And thanks everyone for your patience as we go yeah. through live Sorry, events with technology. Don't me off. <laughs> Thank so, you. Okay. Um, everyone now, because I can't keep both of the tabs open at once, sadly. So this yes, is like, I can see home sitting on. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right, so part two, home sighting. A 1955 newspaper article in the San Bernardino Sun called it home sighting, inverting the jackrabbit homestead name that had followed the prefab in kit houses around in marketing schemes. In the article, um, Graham Berry wrote, this is this article that I have pictured here, modern day homesteading is far different from that of the early days when land was sought for farming. Now it is wanted chiefly for a weekend retreat, end quote. While this journalist separated out home sighting from real homesteading, even the most avid promoters of so-called jackrabbit homesteading were often at pains to say that this act was a far cry from real homesteading. But the name jackrabbit homesteading, as you all know, stuck despite its inaccuracies. Today, um, the name still sticks. And maybe this is one of the reasons why this program was so popular and why so many people filed for these small tract act parcels. So just to give you sort of a basic idea of what this program looked like, what was it? When did it happen? Uh, in 1938, Congress passes this law, the Small Tract Act. It allows people to apply for these small tracts, five acres. So if you're applying for a homestead in the past, that's between 40 and 160 acres. So small tracts are really indeed quite small, as the name would imply. Um, and it's basically a kind of like lease to own type program. So you fill out an application and identify a place. This is actually a picture of that, that application. And you identify a place where you would like to site your home. You have to fulfill certain requirements, uh, which includes fulfilling local zoning requirements. So if you're applying in a county that has zoning regulations, you have to fulfill those in the construction of your home. Um, and then you also have to get the land surveyed. Um, and so altogether, you have sort of just this set of costs, right? Um, and you have to construct a little house, right? You don't have to live in the little house. You only have to build it. And uh, you don't have to, in many cases, the zoning regulations mean that you don't even need to have a kitchen, running water, or bathroom. But we'll get back to all of that later. Um, and so as we're sort of thinking about the requirements, it's actually not a very hard set of requirements to file. And there were even offices in metropolitan areas like Los Angeles where people could go to try to file for their small tracts. So even if you didn't end up proving up your patent, right, fulfilling all these requirements that the government has after you make this initial application, it actually was not very challenging for many people in L.A. to do that. When the program began in 1938, it was run by the General Land Office, an agency that had previously been charged with conducting surveys and granting uh, lands to homesteaders. By 1946, which is the post-war era, right, when this program really starts ramping up and people start applying, the uh, General Land Office was combined with the Grazing Service to form the Bureau of Land Management. The, and this new agency was tasked with not only grazing and land disposal and mining and offshore oil patents, but also this new Small Tract Act program. 
the new agency was ill-suited to receive the influx of cases. And so uh, in a congressional hearing in 1958 about this program, they say that they actually had to roll over 30,000 unresolved cases between 1955 and 1956, which are the years when this program is at its peak. And so this is just a little chart so that you can have an idea of how many cases, and this is across the country, of the small tracts there were, um, just so that you have an idea of sort of the scope of this program. And while the national figures that we see here, you can like look at them and you're like, oh wow, like 86,000, that's a lot of new cases. Um, it doesn't actually really tell us that much um, about the program sort of in a specific way, what was actually happening in San Bernardino County. But one of the things that we know from this congressional hearing and probably from hanging out in San Bernardino County a lot, like many of you have, um, is that most of these filings were happening in, in California and most of those were happening in Southern California. So 90% um, of the small tracts that were filed in Southern California were in the boundaries of what is now San Bernardino County. Um, and this was 75% of what was filed in California. And so, as I mentioned, California, I think it was about, it was right around half of the total applications were in California. And so the, the other states where this program was popular was like Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, Alaska. There are some in Oregon, but really not that many. Um, so to those of you who are familiar with San Bernardino County, I assume a lot of you are, it's not actually very surprising that most of the cases in Southern California would be in San Bernardino County because most of Southern California is San Bernardino County. San Bernardino County, of course, continues to hold the title of the largest county in the U.S. by landmass, and its own letterhead used to include an outline of the county with outlines of small, smaller eastern states like Delaware and Maryland inside of it, right? So um, San Bernardino County is just enormous, right? Um, and so also, as many of you know, the size of San Bernardino County doesn't actually translate into administrative competence at the county level. This was definitely the case for the Small Tract Act, which not only overwhelmed the Bureau of Land Management's administrative capacity, um, but also overwhelmed the county infrastructure. Right. And so um, if we're looking at the volume of what's happening in 1958, there were about 75,000 new applications in Southern California. Um, and of course, not all of these applications were actually successful. The land did not get patented. People did not construct buildings on all of these. Um, and so if we look at some numbers here from this 1958 congressional hearing, we have 75,000 applications were filed, and of those, about 16,000 were rejected. Um, and so here we can just get a little more of a granular view if you're interested in like what was happening in San Bernardino County versus these other counties. Um, so you can just see that the application numbers in San Bernardino County are just much greater than any other county. So there was some activity obviously happening in Riverside, um, but the vast majority, especially if we're looking at this 1957 numbers, it's really just San Bernardino County pulling it up. And if we look at this, this is a fun map. All A lot of this talk comes from these like really old master's theses and dissertations, which are just amazing sources of information for a you know historian type. And so in this map, you can actually see um, from this dissertation where there are areas where people are building and constructing these small tracks. And so all of these areas that are like gray, the gray blobs are all of the areas where the small tracks are getting constructed. As you can see, it's pretty much like spot on Morongo Basin, between Morongo Basin along 247 up to Apple Valley and Lucerne Valley, right? And then these areas right around Barstow. And then you have, um, some spots over by Needles in what is now Lake Havasu. And so as a contemporary reader, when I'm looking back at all of these old dissertations and master's theses, what's fascinating is that you can really see how everyone has a 
clear set of opinions as to like what these small tract acts um, are. And they, have, they seem to have a common understanding of what they're really like. Uh, whereas today, it seems like this sort of common understanding of what these small tracts were like is totally different. And so um, one of my favorite things to do is to understand like why, what did they think about these and like how did they come up with like the names? What did they think about when they're making these maps? Like how did they decide to talk about them? And so there's this master's thesis by this guy, Alex Clark, who I mentioned already. And he has this idea of what the origin is of Jackrabbit Homestead, the name. He says, quote, the rate of deterioration and the ephemeral nature of occupancy has earned the small tracks the popular name Jackrabbit Homesteads, which I feel like is not how we think about them today. But he, and so it's just an interesting thing to look at. Um, another dissertation keeps the scare quotes around the name Jackrabbit Homesteads. That, that's actually what this dissertation uh, image is from. And you can sort of see it in this lower left-hand corner, how there's the quote marks around Jackrabbit Homesteads. And in her characterization, uh, this is Jean Garrison um, of the homesteads. She actually just puts it as like one of the predominant industries of Southern California and the Mojave Desert. So she says, you know, people in the Mojave Desert, they work in government work, transportation, mining, agriculture, grazing, and recreation. And this is part of that recreation camp. And so the fact that masters, uh, thesis and dissertation writers like Clark and Garrison thought that they could easily describe all of these tracks as unsuitable for homesteading. Um, they all have this common understanding of what they really were. They all knew they were vacation homes, not homesteads or primary places to live, but the name persisted. Um, and this is an, uh, from Desert Magazine, in case any of you want to check it out. Um, and this is an article, obviously, entitled Jackrabbit Homesteader. And this was one of the big, uh, prominent regional magazines promoting South Southeastern California, Utah, Arizona, and Nevada during its heyday from 1938 to 1965. In this article, the author, uh, Melissa Stedman, talks about the land hunger in the United States. Um, she says, of course, that the tracks are not really homesteads in the true sense, but then moves on to talk about all the benefits that you can get from living on one. Um, she talks about them as being weekend homes or cabins or rest homes. Um, and one writer, actually, who says that uh, her small tract cabin is her permanent residence, quickly leaves during the summertime. So there are several different accounts in Desert Magazine where you can read about people who went out uh, and built these little homes. Uh, legally speaking, of course, these small tracts are nothing like homesteads. Homesteading laws required agricultural development, full-time residences, and the kinds of improvements that were neither feasible nor pursued on these small tract act five acre parcels. Um, and so in this way, the small tracts are much closer to recreational second homes built on national forest lands under the recreation residence program created in 1915, because that's a thing that everyone knows about, of course. Um, and so one of the things that we begin to see here, right, is there's this clear uh, difference between how people promote the small uh, desert tracts and then what they're actually like in reality. And so the promoters are always advertising these small track deck cabins, not only as vacation homes, but as opportunities to pioneer types to build with their own hands, instead of just working in the growing sector of the workforce that's dedicated to office jobs. The men in gray flannel suits, as the story of 1950s sociology went, were looking for an outlet beyond their drab office jobs and stultifying work lives. And so even though you couldn't actually make a living on these five acre desert tracks, promoters suggested that you could make meaning through labor after you're done with your nine to five. Though most of the small tract act filers did not construct their own ha cabins, the idea that they could was just enough to pursue the project that they, like Roy Rogers and their, his pioneer town set for his show built in 1946, could really inhabit some kind of wild west. The dream that was being sold, that is the dream of living on a frontier in the wild west on the grit of your own hands was exactly the same kind of dream that was being sold in Desert Magazine, where many articles advertising the small tract act lifestyle appeared throughout the 1950s. And of course, the Stedman piece is just one of those. <laughs> 
And you can come next time to learn more about Desert Magazine, the most fun magazine of the California desert in the 1950s. The tone of the magazine was to present the desert as a wonderland, but scholars remind us to be skeptical of the picture that Desert Magazine presented. In his book about the magazine, historian Peter Wilde argues that the version of the desert portrayed in Desert Magazine is, quote, a wonderland, not because we appreciate it on the terms nature presents, but because modern conveniences allow us to indulge ourselves in a chromatic desert fantasy. And so this mirrors sort of this old adage about wilderness that Americans only became uh, came to appreciate wilderness when they could conquer it. Um, and it also reminds us of these other magazines like Sunset or Arizona Highways of which Desert Magazine was sort of a similar publication. They were all trying to sell the region to tourists and the growing middle class who might take their cars financed by the post-war boom out on the highways. For Randall Henderson, the founder of Desert Magazine, the stakes of these jackrabbit homesteads was actually even greater. His brothers, Cliff and Phil, were real estate developers, and he was the beneficiary of their Palm Desert real estate schemes. Um, so Randall Henderson actually benefited directly from the cheerful images of the desert that he peddled, both in the growing circulation of his magazine and in the growing population of Palm Desert. And you can learn about all of this more next time. Um, and so, indeed, many of the ways that the circulation of images of staying in the desert were more fantasy than reality for the Small Tract Act. As a result, perhaps the most famous of the faux homesteaders were those who never actually completed their claims or certainly didn't do it themselves. So Frank Sinatra had patented a parcel in southern Nevada and Ronald Reagan was said to have one, but it never actually was patented. Promoters like Henderson were not the only beneficiaries of the Small Tract Act and tourism boom in the desert, though. Businesses sprung up all over the place to support the Small Tract Act industry and were probably the only way that people actually made a living off of the Small Tract Act's promise of cheap public lands. The most well-known of these groups were probably land locators who charged Small Tract Act land that hadn't already been claimed. Working locally for out-of-towners, land locators would find a tract, draw up a description, and put all the information together so the applicant could take that to the Bureau of Land Management and apply for their parcel. Capitalizing on the Bureau of Land Management's inefficiencies, land locators span from forthright and honest to potentially deceitful. Some of them would have stands like this on the left. Um, that would have long, long lines. And probably the longest line of any of the land locators was for E.B. Moore, who was considered an instigator of the Small Tract Act movement. Um, if, you if you've read anything about the Small Tract Act, you've probably read this Five Acres of Heaven, which is written, uh, which is actually not a historical document, but rather an advertising pamphlet written by the Los Angeles Times journalist Ed Ainsworth. Um, so even though this document's often taken as sort of like the gospel truth of the Small Tract Act, it's laudatory treatment of Moore's life story and his mission in creating the enterprise from the Small Tract Act is obviously mid-century advertising at its best. Um, and so one way that we can know this for sure is you, uh, this is actually from a letter in the archives at UCLA of Ed Ainsworth's papers, right? So you can read a letter from E.B. Moore himself, pleased by the financial benefits that the little pamphlet, Five Acres of Heaven, has brought to him. And he uses this also as sort of an introduction to the piece. Um, looking through Ainsworth's archives, you can also see that Ainsworth himself was always a hustler looking for opportunities to write for money outside of his newspaper jobs at all times. So he was probably paid handsomely for um, writing this piece for E.B. Moore. And to be fair to Moore, Moore was very successful. He really made the Small Tract Act work in the Morongo Basin, and it was probably the reason why the Morongo Basin had so many applicants, even in comparison to the rest of Southern California. 
Um, and so more, many people consider to be sort of on the more forthright, honest end of these land speculators, but there were also very deceptive and deceitful land locators. Um, so there were articles that were published alongside uh, sort of like more advertising type small tract acts that discourage potential filers from using land locators because they would always double file lands, um, which means that they would say two applicants for one parcel. And in all honesty, this is like not very uh, unfamiliar for Southern California real estate. This is like pretty much part and parcel what's always happening in Southern California. Uh, so we could look back in the 1880s, same sort of stuff is happening. The other industry that really sprung up and was quite successful as a result of the Small Tract Act was the uh, private infrastructure that was supporting the construction of minimum small tract cabins, which are basically shacks that are built specifically for small tract act filers. Though many companies built them, one really stood out, which is Homestead Supplies Inc. of Yucca Valley. And you can see their advertisement here. Not only did they have one of the most robust advertising schemes of any of these companies, but they were said to have built 14,000 minimum small tract cabins between 1950 and 1960, which really just gives you a sense of like, wow, there were a ton of these, especially like, you know, in between like in the Morongo Basin and then up into Apple Valley and throughout the high desert. Um, these buildings, these minimum small tract act cabins only sought to meet the 192 square foot square minimum required by the Bureau of Land Management and the building issue permits were issued by the county, San Bernardino County, of course, for only a dollar without requiring any plans for the actual building. Altogether, um, interested investors would only need to spend around $50 for a fee um, in order to complete the application and to lease the property before they buy it, around $700 for a 12 by 16 home, $200 for a survey and a purchase of the property, an optional outhouse. Um, and then all of that together totals around $1,000 back then, which is around, which is under $10,000 today. So it's around uh, $9,000 in today's dollars. So if we think about it, right, the cheapness of desert lands and the fact that a comfortably middle class family could always at least begin an investment by filing this $50 fee to a small tract act parcel means that many did, often marrying their dreams to a sub of a subpar constructed house for a shot at what was considered mostly neglected surplus Bureau of Land Management lands. And as the Small Tract Act boom took place, it was rapidly becoming very clear that something was very wrong. So this is a map from one of these uh, dissertations. You can see that this is uh, small, this, these are different Small Tract Act filings. You can see that it is very disorganized, which is one of the things that urban planners hated about the Small Tract Act. Um, and so later maps of these heavily home sited areas show this very strange, we could call this a very strange configuration of homes without roads and contemporary small tract act homeowners will tell you about the problem with their rural road districts and the ambiguity of whether or not the roads are actually owned by them, the county or the federal government. And even back then in the 60s and 70s, these problems were very obvious and complaints must have been voluminous to prod San Bernardino County to actually open a building and safety office in Victorville in August of 1955 um, when they actually uh, implemented a building code for the high desert portion of the county. They required the new buildings to meet a minimum 400 square foot requirement. Um, which is basically doubling from the 192 number that I mentioned before, um, which meant that this doubling in size meant that it was effectively a doubling in cost for these new people who are constructing these small tract act homes. So um, the, the cost of constructing the cabin moves from about $700 to about $1,400. And at this exact moment, the rate of permitting for cabins really slowed considerably in San Bernardino County. 
1957, as a result of the extreme number of filings and other problems, San Bernardino County filled a more filed a moratorium on new small tract applications and nation number nationwide numbers dropped dramatically when the most popular small tract act filing location no longer existed. When the moratorium was lifted later, construction actually didn't ever pick up accordingly to the pre-moratorium level and the small tract act boom was officially over. So on to part three abandonment. Early on, uh, activists, scholars, and residents were already complaining about the sad state of the Small Tract Act cabins. My favorite is a 1962 article by Kenneth Schneider, an urban planner who complains about the dramatic unplanned growth in the region. He says, of course, that Yucca Valley grew more than a thousand percent in 10 years, which is true. Unlike cities in which settlers spread out from an urban core, the settlement dispersed and interspersed with public lands is in many places all at the same time, resulting in desert vistas as far as the eye can see that are spotted with small structures, as Schneider says. Um, he continues to describe uh, in this piece what he sees as the archetype of a small tract. Quote, a typical improved small tract parcel has an unfinished garage size mass produced shack that is especially designed for the small tract market. There are rarely streets, utilities, and other ground improvements. In most areas, one can pass by a hundred vandalized vacant structures before finding an occupied or substantial one. End quote. Uh, Schneider obviously disparages the destruction that this has done to Southern California and more specifically to San Bernardino County, which had the most small tracts of any place. From this account and other accounts in the 1970s, we know that Small Tract Act cabins were already falling apart soon after they were built, as you can see in this image from the Alex Clark master's thesis that I mentioned earlier. This makes sense to us, right, because the cabins were shoddily constructed and built for their speculative value rather than actually recreational or use value. Um, and such of a fallout went really beyond the physical decay of the small tract act structures. Geographer William Russell, in his study of the Morongo Valley and Yucca Valley, published in 1970, thinks that the small tract act, act acted as one of the ma major reasons, along with development of technologies like air conditioning and reliable cars, that enabled the rapid expansion of areas like Yucca Valley, which grew 16, 1,623% over a period of 20 years and advertised itself as one of the fastest growing and therefore best investments of real estate in the country. While the Small Tract Act had fallout far outside its world by promoting the desert and making more people aware of the rural areas of California, it also had serious effects within its own scope, particularly with the effects of land speculation. Geographer Alex Clark estimated that 57% of small tracts were never occupied when he needed to study in 1971, which is pretty early on in the whole, like, you know, there was, there's some time, a little bit of time when the program had ended, but, uh, you know, enough time that he would, would have known if lots of people had been there. And so he concludes actually that the Small Tract Act filings were mostly speculative from the start. Um, and at the time, uh, Bureau of Land Management officials estimated that 60% of applications were in good faith, even though, you know, about the same percentage uh, seems like they were speculative from the start. And when we look at these newspaper articles from the time, um, you, they all have these sorts of like great titles like Mojave Desert Lures Land Prospectors. Most of them are all about how people are just in the desert to just buy some land, construct a shack, increase in value, sell it to someone else, right? But before long for many of these parcel owners, taxes and time caught up to these enterprising landowners and their investments soon became to also literally crumble. The city of Barstow began to complain about the eyesores surrounding the town as did locals elsewhere. Um, pictures from the era show the ways that the Small Tract Act failed to produce lasting development, creating instead checkerboarded ownership whose effects would far outlast the structures themselves. 
and this is an article about uh, unhappy people in Barstow in the 70s, which is a seemingly timeless. I feel like this is like a very timeless newspaper article because you have like Homestead Shacks, Pester Barstow, classic. It may take inner Dead Sea to preserve life in the Salton Sea. We're still at that with the Salton Sea. There's another article about a vehicle crash. It's like pretty much you could just transpose this into today. Um, as later generations took on their family's cabins, many of them forgot that they actually owned it at all, which meant that they stopped paying the tax, property taxes on it. And the inevitable tax sale to the next new investor um, happened. And then you just sort of have this cycle of like people like buying this property, thinking that it might be a new investment, uh, deciding that it's not a good investment or forgetting about it and then not paying the taxes. And then again, just another cycle of someone else buying it. Um, the lack of knowledge of these family vacation homes was perhaps most evident when San Bernardino County partnered with local citizens in the 1990s for a beautification program that they called Shack Attack in which 450 unsightly homes were removed by Shack Attack organizers and individual families who were reached through the program. Many contacted through the program were actually unaware that they owned the land, let alone a dilapidated shack in the desert. At the time, the program was very controversial, um, with some arguing that the shacks are part of desert heritage and should be protected rather than seen as eyesores that are in need of cleanup. But perhaps the question here is not actually about how the cabins have been falling down over time. We know from newspapers and academic articles published in the 60s and 70s that the shacks were unsightly even then, but how our relationship to these shacks has changed today in a time characterized by certain forms of conspicuous back to the landing and new new age spirituality that haunts so-called tiny homes. We can now advertise them again, as safely as only two hours away from the metropolis without traffic. As we look back at the history of these tiny homes, we know that their history is not only in the land that came from the general land office, what then became the Bureau of Land Management. The lands along the river by Needles, Chemehuevi and Mojave territory made it into small tract housing. The lands in the Morongo Basin, Kalia, Chemehuevi and Serrano territory made into small tract act housing. The lands by Barstow, Serrano lands. All of these were made into vacation homes that were constructed with a certain idea of the American dream, quickly abandoned after a couple of escapes from the growing city of uh, Los Angeles. The dream, as we can see here, was not actually even of homesteading or maybe even of living in the desert. It was just a desire to get away from it all, to stop being the man in the gray flannel suit, to apply oneself to building that prefabricated home. The dream quickly fell apart and now we're left, left with the cabins, the massive scale of which was scattered over 25,000 square miles or 16 million acres of the California desert, despite the fact that all the filings were only tiny parcels of five acres each. The magnitude of this program, despite its short life, is seen on the landscape today, small houses, many without bathrooms, supposedly reclaimed as Airbnbs. All right, so I am ready for questions. Um, hopefully. Okay. Thank you so much for that, Julia. That was that was super fun, super interesting, and and just fascinating to to hear how it all went down. Um, we have a couple of questions here, so let me go down through these for you. Uh, cool. We'll leave all the technical logistical questions at the end for uh, about like replays and such. But um, let's begin with the related ones. So, uh, so Larry asked, "Were lots ever sold by the government without improvements?" Uh, were. So in order to file for a small tract, basically it's like this lease to own program, right? So you, at the beginning of the lease to own program, you don't have any improvements on the land. Um, but then as you transition into the ownership part, you have to prove that you have improvements. And so um, you have to construct this shack of a certain size um, through the small tract act program. Um, and then later on, when more zoning requirements are filed, you have to have an outhouse. There are actually stories, which I think these are like hilarious, but also very disturbing, um, in which people would like rent an outhouse and then just bring the outhouse 
onto their parcel and then they would have it. They would like take all the pictures, they'd send it into the federal government and then they'd be done, right? And then they would like be like, okay, no more outhouse, we're done. Um, and so I am sure that if people really wanted to, they could do the same exact thing actually for the small tract act cabins themselves. Um, because if you can fake an outhouse, you can fake a cabin. Uh, but it just seems less likely because it would be a bigger thing to transport than an outhouse is very right. small and very convenient to move. Um, however, obviously, there were many other government land disposal programs outside of the Small Tract Act where you did not have requirements to make improvement on the land um, or the kinds of improvements that you had to make, make were different. So those all fall into a different category. That's fascinating. And I think with the parallel with Airbnb, I remember um, I read somewhere and then was confirmed through through friends that um, know the Airbnb business that some people to qualify as like a plus Airbnb plus or premium or something like that, they'll get the appliances that are necessary for it, take pictures, send them to Airbnb, get the qualification and then return the items to the, to oh, the seller. So. so super interesting how there's all these parallels now. Uh, from Laura, she said, additionally, is the recreation residence program of 1915 still operational as it were? Could I move to a national park or at least to one that existed in 1915? Yeah, so the recreation residence program is through the U.S. Forest Service, um, but it doesn't really exist anymore. So there are still cabins that were constructed under that program. Um, but they no longer sort of like have like new applicants. So pretty much almost in the continental US, all of the land disposal programs, including the Small Tract Act, ended in 1976 with the pas passage of FLIPMA, which is the Federal Lands Policy and Management Act of 1976, you know, everyone's favorite congressional act. Um, and so that really ended most, like the vast majority of these land disposal programs. Got it. So we cannot move into a national park. <laughs> yeah, not anymore. <laughs> and then Laura also asked, I know the Allotment Act was passed before the Small Tract Act, but are there ways in which the two intersect? And she said, all the states you named with Small Tract Act lands have significant native populations. Yeah, so this is a really interesting question because it's uh, very, very complicated in part because uh, so California has a very distinct and odd uh, situation in terms of how reservations were recognized and allotted and particularly in Southern California. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but it's like it's, it is particularly complicated because most Southern California um reservations were not actually allotted under the Allotment Act. And so basically what ended up happening in Southern California and in California more broadly is that uh, native tribes were all put onto very small uh, reservations that, and were recognized as very small groups rather than larger groups. Um, so you have places like Hopi, Navajo, Diné lands, right? These are huge reservations. In California, there are no reservations that are that big. And this is a result of like both historical accident and also uh, the systematic genocide that was perpetuated against California native peoples. And so um, if we like, so if we think about it in that context, like yes, tons of these were already native lands, but they were already dispossessed by the time the government is handing them out because the government has already put tribes or decided on what the size of reservations are going to be in pretty much like the 1880s, 1890s in Southern California. There are a couple of exceptions to that, but for the most part, um, by the time the Small Tract Act comes along in 1938, uh, the locations of reservations and size has already been settled, um, although obviously it was still native land, even when they're giving it out as these homesteads. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that um, probably answered another question that I'm looking at on the chat that says, you know, 
how do you know much more about when and how the land was taken from the Chemehuevi? Um, yeah, well, so for the Chemehuevi, specifically for the Oasis of Mara, is that's what I assume the question is about. Um, and so the for the Oasis of Mara, what happened is basically so when the railroad comes through, they get uh, there's, they get certain land as part of being a transcontinental railroad. There were like rules governing how they would get land. And, um, and so they would get every other section section is 640 acres, mile by mile square. And, uh, one of the sections that they got was the Oasis of Mara without actually having surveyed it beforehand in advance. Right. Cause it's just every other, it's just a checkerboard. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. Um, and so this, had happened when the transcontinentals came through. They basically did nothing with the parcel. Um, and then Chimuevis, uh, for the most part, stopped living in the Oasis of Mara around 1910, which is around the time of the Willy Boy incident, if you're familiar with that. Um, and so um, you can read a lot more about this. I don't want to spend forever talking about this. Um, there are several books by Clifford, the historian Clifford Trafser. Um, that's T, I can write his name in the chat. Yeah, if you can, if you can write that, <laughs> um, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, because it, it's just hard. For um, So there's a book uh, that he wrote a couple years ago that came out, I think like 2015, 2016, called The Chemoebi Song. He really goes into all of this history in a deeper way than I'm going to go into it right now. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, resource. Um, I have a question here from Melanie and she is asking how many of these referring to the homesteads are being revitalized in the current times as an Airbnb? Um, yeah, so this is a good question, but one that I do not have an answer to. Um, and I will give you sort of like two quick reasons why we don't have an answer to these, this question. Um, so the first one is, as you may know, many tech companies, including Airbnb, are very restrictive and private about their data. It is very challenging to actually know how many of anything is on Airbnb at any given time. And so for that reason, it is very hard to know. However, there are actually some programs where, um, particularly in the Morongo Basin, people uh, people who own Airbnbs have been working with the county on determining what the Airbnb regulations should look like. And so there is a chance that some of that data could be made publicly available. Um, and then the other reason why we don't have a very, or why I don't have a very compellingly good answer to this question is that, so I mentioned this program, Shack Attack, that was happening in the 90s in San Bernardino County. Um, as we know from that program, basically no one actually knew that they owned these parcels and what they, you know, they didn't, they didn't know that they owned it. They didn't know where they were if they did own it. And the sort of like records were very, very poor. Um, and so uh, if someone wanted to do the kinds of studies that these dissertations in the 60s did, you totally could. Like you could spend a lot of time looking at the San Bernardino County records, figuring out where every individual parcel is, how many acres it is. If it was a small tract act, tract act parcel, you could parse all of that out. It would just take you eons. And so like in the future, I have considered doing this, but <laughs> I don't have a current, I don't have a current answer for you on that, sorry. <laughs> it sounds like a fun project though. <laughs> And yeah, then some hundred number sounds about right to me that Crystal put in the chat. Oh, there you go. Like 1200 Airbnbs in the room. Wow. Um, and then Melanie also asked that she noticed that you said supposedly reclaimed as Airbnbs. So would you want to elaborate a little bit on that? Um, sure. So, I mean, I think what, what is interesting about the small tract act program to me is that many people ha like come in and they have this idea that like, okay, there are like people who were like really homesteading in the 1950s and like they were like working the land. It comes with the idea of homesteading comes with a certain set of assumptions about what these people were actually doing. And we know 
based on this historical research that I've done and that other people have done, that no one was actually doing this, right? Um, and so what's interesting about that today is there's sort of like this movement of people um, who I would sort of call like new, new agers, which are people my age, right? They're millennials um, who are really interested in like getting back on the land, like doing all this sort of stuff, which is also very similarly to what was happening in the 1950s. Like they're not actually getting back on the land. They're not actually like doing um, the same sorts of homesteading things. And so the argument that like they're supposedly reclaiming through Airbnbs is the same argument that like, yeah, like they think that they're like doing this authentic homesteading experience, but at the same time, it's like exactly what was happening in the 1950s where people were making these claims to doing uh, these sorts of like, you know, exciting homesteading type experiences without actually doing anything at all. So that's that's my main argument there. No, thank, thank you for that. Uh, from Jeremy, he says, I've noticed that there's a new San Bernardino County law that prohibits an owner of a recreational cabin to live there for more than four days per month unless you go through the county and get it zoned as a single family residence. However, it seems like some of these cabins have already been zoned as single family residences. So how does that work? Have some been grandfathered yeah. in and others not? Yeah, so um, I first I want to preface this by saying I cannot offer you legal advice. I'm not a county zoner. So if you have questions on legal advice, I'm not your lady. I'm telling you based on my own experience and people who I know what I think about the answer to this question. Um, and so one of the big issues for thinking about people living in these recreational homes is that basically they were when many of these were constructed in the 1950s, they were built according to county zoning, which at that point we know there was no county zoning until 1955 in the desert portions of San Bernardino County. There were no rules. And so basically, if your cabin remained the same between when it was constructed in 1955 or before 1955 and today, if there were no changes made, then you are good to go. You can keep that cabin. You can live in that cabin that doesn't have any electricity, any water, any bathroom, like you can live there, you can do it. The problem is when you start making major improvements to a cabin, then you have to bring the whole thing up to code. Hmm. So particularly for some of these very small cabins, um, the minimum, the minimum like single family house size in San Bernardino County, which I actually think they are working on revising, but I'm not sure if they have actually made that revision was 750 feet, which obviously even the ones made under the revised statutes uh, in 1955 were only 400 feet. Um, so basically like once you make one improvement, then the whole thing has to be up to code. That means you would have to be 750 feet. You uh, might have to be, uh, like you have to have your septic up to code, you have to have water up to code, like there are all sorts of things. So it's like, as soon as you make any improvement, then you sort of like have to, you are no longer grandfathered in anymore. Wow, yeah. thanks for that. Yeah, that, I mean, that makes sense, but it's a little extreme, right? If you wanted to just do a little thing and now you yeah, have to and pay I for the whole renovation. Yeah, I think that Don's comment in the chat, I do think it has been reduced because I remember like a couple years ago, people saying it was going to um, get reduced, so. Right. Oh, good to know. Um, how can you purchase a small home track today? Uh, so if you want to get a small tract act home today, you just got to purchase it from someone who is selling it. That's that just like how you would normally get land. You would just buy it from someone who's selling it. So um, you could also buy it at tax sale. So I mentioned this tax sale mechanism, right, where uh, people don't pay their taxes for five years. And then um, if you don't pay your taxes for five years, then the county repossesses your property and then they sell it at auction um, under 
this is just like how property taxes work. Um, and so you could potentially buy one of these homes at tax sale. It has actually become an increasingly popular mode of uh, speculation in small tract act houses in the Brongo Basin. So it used to be that through a, uh, like a tax sale, you'd be paying like 50% of the value, um, but now it's actually changed. So you would be like, you're pretty much paying much closer to like uh, 70, 80, 100% of the value because uh, they're just very popular speculative properties for people to buy. Wow, that's incredible. What what a change. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's land speculation for you. Right. So fun. Uh, we have another question from Laura. She says, yeah. does the Small Tract Act facilitate or hinder railroad development? She says, I'm not sure if San Bernardino is really crisscross with that many rails, but did it make it easier for rail barons to claim ownership? Yeah, well, so the railroad stuff pretty much is all happening prior to the Small Tract Act stuff. Um, and so one of the interesting things about the Small Tract Act program is that a number, basically a lot of people um, apply for land under the Small Tract Act program and the land is very cheap. Um, and the railroad at that same time is also trying to like offload and sell their lands and they're actually less successful um, to like in their attempts to get rid of their land um, because of the Small Tract Act program where the government is getting rid of a bunch of land. Um, and so the railroaders were like not super affected by it other than sort of this like effect of uh you know, competitors in the land market. Got it. Thank you. Uh, we got a new question from Aaron. Are they super strict on the code improvements, meaning county officials are continually coming into the area and busting people or are people flying under the radar with improvements? It seems these areas will continue to fall into this repair. If these homes are not able to be easily upgraded. Uh, yeah, so this is an interesting question and is very much contingent on uh, like a number of factors that I'm like that I, it is impossible to go into all of them. Um, so one of the major mechanisms for code enforcement is neighbors calling. So if someone notices that something funky is happening, then they will just call and say, hey, some code enforcement, something weird is happening over here get your butts over here, give these people a fine, right? And like the county gets a lot of money from code enforcement, right? It's just a fine, it just goes straight into their coffers. They have an incentive to like find these different uh, code enforcement violations because then they can find people. Um, however, that being said, right, you have this like code enforcement hotline, people, the county can make money. Um, but at the same time, we all know San Bernardino County overstretched, does not have the resources to like really actively go after a lot of this code enforcement, but they will get you eventually. That's, I mean, the end story of code enforcement is if you like are making some improvements to your home and then they find out about it five years later when you're trying to sell it, 10 years later, they're gonna be like, hey, when did this improvement happen? And you'll be like, oh, I, I don't know. I think it happened in the seventies. And they'll be like, that's weird. Cause this has, this, you know, is date stamped with like, you know, 20, 20, 2019, like, isn't that odd? Like, it's just not not good to try to like get away with uh, code enforcement. Not worth it, it sounds like, especially if it's also a matter of community accountability where your yeah. neighbors are taking care of, of what's going on. Um, you definitely don't want to be on the wrong side of that, I, yeah. I would say. Um, okay, I think there's just one last question that I, it skipped me earlier from Kevin, it says, what is the legacy of displacement of native peoples such as the Serrano? And that's I guess like, in, in, in relation to, to this, which I think we've, we talked about it a yeah, lot. Yeah, that's like a really big question. Um, and so I think like what's interesting about the Small Tract Act, right, is like this is a form of like secondary dispossession, right? 
Um, you have sort of like this initial round of dispossession in which native peoples are moved onto small reservations for oftentimes forced into working uh, wage jobs because their previous forms of supporting themselves are no longer available to them um, because their land has been taken away, right? Um, and then what's interesting and strange about the Small Tract Act program is that you have all this land that's basically, for the most part, being given to settlers who don't actually care about the land. They like, they're buying it as a speculative investment, maybe as a weekend home, maybe they're like jazzed about that, whatever. Um, but they don't actually, most of them don't actually end up doing anything with this parcel, right? We have this sick, like this 57% number from Clark, which I'm pretty inclined to believe because he's like close enough in time to it. Um, even if the BLM people think that 60% of people were acting in good faith, uh, you know, they're, they're, we know that many of these were abandoned. Many of them were knocked down. Uh, that's why there are so many weird five tracked parcel, five acre tracked parcels that don't have any stuff on them. Um, and so, I mean, like what's like horrendously depressing about all this, right, is you have this like moment of massive dispossession um, of native peoples. And then you have all these settlers who are being basically given this land for free and then not doing anything with it at all. And just like leaving, like getting excited about it for 10 minutes and then leaving. So yeah, that's a, that's my Debbie Downer talk for everyone. Yeah, for sure. No, I mean, it's, and I think these are, these are important conversations to be had too, you know? So I'm, I'm really happy and that I'm grateful that the audience brought it up because I think often when we talk about history, you know, his story, who wrote it, who, who gets to say what gets taught and, and written about. So thank you also for giving us a little more, bit more context on it. Um, I think that's all through the actual uh, presentation related question. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Julia. I just want to talk briefly about the logistical stuff that people have been talking about. Um, so yes, this talk will be available for replay. So as soon as we close the live, you can go to the same webpage, joshuatree.org forward slash live, and you'll be able to see it for a couple of days until we load our um, upcoming presentation. So it will be available for a little bit, and then we are uh, still kind of gathering ideas on how we're going to be making all the replays from Desert Live available in the future, but know that they will be available. Um, somebody else also asked Julia if it's possible that you share the presentation as a, as a file maybe, or just because sometimes depending on everyone's connection, they can get, they can look blurry. Yeah. Um, so some of them, um, it's a complicated question because there are copyright questions involved yes. basically. Um, but I can share some of the images, but probably not all of them in like a format for everyone just because um, a lot of these, as I mentioned, are uh, copyrighted by the archives that they belong to. And so I can't share them without the permission of the archives. Right, but thank I you for that. Back and sort of identify the things that I can share um and maybe we could put i could put together like a link to some of the information that i drew upon so like if people are really jazzed about um learning more about the 1958 congressional hearings which were actually surprisingly exciting um that is publicly available online and you can very easily find that okay great thanks thanks for letting us know and we'll we'll keep you guys posted once julia gets back to us with the couple of images that we're able to share and then the last question is from philip and he asks if will an online transcript of the talk be available later in addition to the documents shown so we just spoke about the documents um, the online transcript, that is actually a great question. And thank you for bringing that up. As I said, we're kind of still in the brainstorm phase of how we can make this um, talks accessible for everyone. So hopefully we we find a, a way to, to get transcripts as well as the replays. Yeah, and I do have like a partial 
not everything that I say is written down, but many of the things I do say are written down. So we might be able to work that out too. Oh, that will be great. Yeah, like if you can provide your your guiding text, uh, yeah. that that will probably be a great way to to share with the audience. So that was a wonderful presentation, Julia. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone who joined us today. Julia is going to be back on July 24th to talk about the golden era of Desert Magazine, yeah. which yeah. kind of ties into the Mary Beale presentation a couple of weeks ago, which was also fantastic. If you, if you haven't seen it, stay tuned on the newsletter for the replay. Um, and then next week, if you guys are around on Wednesday at four o'clock Pacific time, we are having Chrissy Drutman from Brown Girl Green bringing us a presentation slash workshop about nearby nature and how can we as individuals make the outdoors more accessible for all. So we're also really excited about that. Um, there's a bunch of other events coming up. Check the JTNPA Instagram. And also you can find the new Desert Institute Instagram, which is at JT Desert Institute. I'm writing it on the on the chat for you. So go find us on Instagram, follow our new page. Um, we'll be posting some updates there in, in the coming days as we start ramping that up. And yeah, I hope we get to see some of you again. And Julia, thank you so much again. We'll see you in two weeks. Yeah, two weeks, everyone. Hope to see you again. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye.